We formed up on Barracudas, not a very nice aircraft. It was a high wing monoplane, and if you, under certain circumstances, you yank the stick back a bit hard, you flip over on her back, which was not healthy if you were low down. <laughs> I mean, we carried a 1600 pound bomb underneath, or a torpedo, but there was no arm, there was one gun on it firing backwards. And the, pilot, the air gunner had to be very careful with that, or he should fire his own tail off. Because there was no stop, you could actually like shooting yourself in the foot. And we used to go down at a fair angle when we were dive bombing. And if you look round, if you had the nerve to look round, your tail was going like that, waggling about. And they had it cracked, or the spars cracked, and they had to re, re they had to strengthen that. Then the same thing happened with the wings, and the constant speed you didn't need. The propeller was quite dodgy, it would overrun, and you heard some nasty noises. But so we were very pleased in the end to get rid of it. And quite honestly, though a lot of pilots thought they were very nice to fly, well, they were, and it was the most modern thing we'd ever flown, um, they were useless. in the making, the new high-wing all-metal aircraft specially designed in Britain for the fleet air arm. Note the strong, sturdy build to stand the shock of being launched and landed on an aircraft carrier and the retractable undercarriage, like the limb of a bird. She carries a dinghy and rescue equipment in the fuselage and is equipped for using torpedoes, bombs and mines. Note the high-set tailplane. Out on test. There was a squadron of torpedo bombers working up, and they had this ghastly new plane called a Barracuda. God, I flew one once and that's an abortion. And it was a typical fairy body with a Merlin engine, a high tail, high wings, way off the ground, high up, with tremendously long undercarriage. And when you got airborne, it, it, you didn't pick up the undercarriage, it went down to get it. <laughs> because it sank, <laughs> and the undercarriage sort of folded itself up and finally flew through one of the wings, and it became airborne. And I had to test fly one once, I'd been repaired. God, scared the living day out of me. Took me off what it meant. It was meant to be a dive bomber, so I had to dive bomb it, you know. Everything shook and rattled. <laughs> it was an awful plane. It was, they'd just taken the fairy former and made it into, uh, into a torpedo bomber. All the naval air stations have HMS names, and they're all names of birds. But I can't always remember what it was. <laughs> but I think Crail was called HMS Landrail. And <clears throat> Crail was where we converted to the operational type of aircraft that we were going to fly. And in this case, it was the Barracuda. Uh, the Barracuda was referred to as a TBR aircraft, Torpedo Bomber Reconnaissance. Now the aircraft, it had an inline engine, a high wing monoplane. The only thing above the wing was the sort of glass house where the pilot, observer and air gunner could see out. And the rest of the fuselage was below the wing. And it had a crew of three, pilot, observer and air gunner. And the air gunner was also the wireless operator. I think it was really one almost without vices. But uh, <clears throat> it had a very bad reputation, unfortunately. It's a very good dive bomber. She had dive brakes, fantastic dive brakes on her. And she could dive it very nearly vertically. And that was her strength. They had an awful lot of trouble with them. The wings kept dropping off, which wasn't uh, the best of things. <laughs> uh, easy to deck land, easy to deck land, but I wouldn't like to have gone an operational squadron with them.
Uh, the early ones were but rather dangerous. Again, a couple of people that were in my course uh, went to uh, the training one at East Haven where they were flying barracudas and two of them were killed. They, 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 they had dive bombing flaps and apparently uh, it, when, you, when you did a dive bombing attack you had to put these flaps down and then when you retracted them when you were coming in, the, the, the thing just used to go straight into the water. <laughs> That's a, not a good thing to do. All the accidents in Barracudas gave the Barracuda a bad name but to be honest I didn't think it was a bad aircraft. The drawback is that this was the first time that um, a monoplane had been used by the fleet air arm for this sort of work because previously it had been either the swordfish or the albacore and all the instructors had done all their operational flying on swordfish or albacores and they had come into this business and the first squadrons were just forming, so they had never flown the aircraft operationally. They had learned how to fly it, and then they were teaching us how to fly it. But the, the difficulty was they couldn't really teach us about the operational flying, which was the object of the exercise. She had a twin Vickers gas operated, but the pilots didn't like them using it because you had to lift the glass house up at the back and that spoiled the aerodynamics of the aircraft. We did, we did torpedo bombing. We did dive bombing mainly. They, they kind of decided that it was the, the best thing for it. We used to do night dive bombing. Night dive bombing, you had a range with a, a very small triangular float on it, about... 25 feet triangular sides and there would be wrens on shore with instruments so when a barracuda was carrying armaments it could be either the torpedo under the belly of the aircraft or a bigger bomb a 1600 pound bomb or smaller bombs 250 pound bombs perhaps four under the wings or four depth charges under the wings. Now, the, a live torpedo is probably about um, 20 feet long, 22 inches diameter, and weighing, oh, I suppose, a bit over a ton, of which, I think, if I remember rightly, 500 pounds was warhead. The rest was um, engine and fuel. And um, the dummy torpedo was... Uh, a block of concrete in roughly the same dimensions and weight as a live torpedo. And this was just strapped on into the torpedo crutches which were underneath the fuselage of the aircraft. And of course there are always apocryphal stories of somebody having dropped a dummy torpedo. And the one that amused me most was where the dummy torpedo landed in the churchyard at Crail and was left standing there as a <laughs> vertical reminder. The Barracuda, says our encyclopedia, is a shark-like fish which is not easily exhausted and springs about in most reckless fashion, sometimes called the wolf of the seas. It had a Merlin 32 engine, which was one of the Merlins that was no good. It was made for the Spitfire, but it was underpowered. So they put it in the Barracuda, which was a heavier aircraft, so it was even more underpowered. I mean, we, we, we used to do about 140 knots cruising. She was reputed to be able to do 220 knots, but I never got that out of her. It was terribly underpowered. You used to, the engine used to rasp away, got airborne. Anyway, this barracuda squadron came to our little grass field to do night flying. And, uh, and these things were underpowered. And one 
plane never came back on its circuit. So we set off to find it. In the first heads we found some wheels. <laughs> Next heads we found something else. And finally he belly landed beyond that. He just didn't have enough power to get up. <laughs> he was all right with the plane's arrival. <laughs> I was mainly testing sea fires, and of course, the sea fire you show off, you know, as soon as you get over one, you don't climb, you pick your wheels up as you are, then you just do that. I'd done about four sea fire tests at that sunny, sunny day in Brisbane, and we had the observer came up for, up for a ride in the Barracuda. I don't think they come and test that one high, will you? Please, just been through the workshops. I took it off, of course, I just got airborne, picked the wheels up. <laughs> pull, I pull the stick back, and I wound the, the control tab, and it just got away with the tailbone scraping, going like that. And then when the wheels came up, it took so it set up again. <laughs> oh dear. A lot of fun. I had a lot of time for the Barracuda, except for the fact that it was very much underpowered. It was supposed to have a Griffin engine, but the RAF claimed all the Griffin engines for their uh, developed Spitfires, and we finished up with the Merlin, which was a lot less horsepower, and as a result, the aircraft was really quite underpowered for the work it was required to do. And in order to get the power to take off, we had to have um, a, a booster which increased the pressure in the inlet manifold. And uh, instead of being up to plus three or plus four, which was quite usual, we had to go to plus 18 to get airborne in the hot weather. And of course, you couldn't maintain that uh, amount of power in the engine, which really wasn't designed for it. So we were allowed to keep the engine running at plus 18 for no more than one minute. And then you had to shut off the turbine and go back to whatever power you could get with what was left. Trinkamalee, the, the, the Barracuda was totally useless out there, really. We did one or two attacks on Sumatra. But it had a very low range. We only had four and a half hours, four and a quarter hours flying. That was total. So that meant that you you should keep it down to three, three and a half hours to allow yourself some leeway. And uh, of course, the distances were so great there. And then they, they didn't do so well in the heat. It didn't fly as well as it might have done. So they got rid of it and uh, they took American Avengers on board, which weren't such good dive bombers, but they had much greater range and uh, the people that flew them seemed to like them, so that was all right. You know, in a hot climate, the air is thinner and you're not taking as much in through the same size of intake. So in order to get the amount of air in to combust with the fuel and give you correct running of the engine, it uh, needs a higher um, induction in uh, pressure in the induction intake. And it really means that the aircraft engine is running at higher speeds in order to get the thing operating properly. And really taking off could be quite a problem if you were trying to take off with, say, a torpedo, which weighed 2,200 pounds. And um, that would be really very tricky with uh, a barracuda in a hot climate. I don't know if it could have done it. But we did it with bombs just to see what it was like. But then again, for... 250 pound bombs is only a thousand pounds weight but because they're carried under the wings there's an awful lot of drag and that was really making the aircraft very difficult to handle at slow speeds and on the deck but it coped but just we weren't going to be the most brilliant things in aviation that's for sure Here 
sure they're coming back to make the tricky landing on deck. Each plane has to be pulled up short or it would crash into other aircraft or even overrun the bows of the carrier. An arrestor hook lowered from the plane as she lands catches one of the steel cables stretched across the deck. She's pulled up within a few feet of landing. Watch out, Japan, for the barracudas, the wolves of the sea. I think it was a very rugged aircraft, but a lot of people um, didn't like it because when they had been dive-bombing aircraft, the same aircraft, for four or five or six or more flights, perhaps 20 or 30 flights, sometimes the maintenance people were finding loose rivets. And, of course, this used to worry everyone because uh, they wondered if the wing would fall off. So they did watch the rivet situation closely, but... Yeah, I thought that really the aircraft was quite rugged. And just to give you an example of one occasion when something went wrong, um, the barracuda was flying in towards the target ship and he got too low and his torpedo struck the sea and that pulled the torpedo off the bottom of the aircraft. And of course that was... Um, the crutches holding the torpedo were fixed to main frames in the aircraft. So when it was pulled off, the main frames broke, and the observer on that occasion was sitting between the main frames, and he disappeared with the torpedo. But uh, the aircraft continued to fly, but with this great big hole in the bottom. I remember one night we were doing deck landing training, the Crail in Scotland, and um, that, that meant we were just going around doing circuits and bumps. Probably do about six each, stop at the end of the air uh, runway, and let the next pilot get in, and so on. Um, they suddenly stopped all affair because the wings were bending, and the main spar rivets were cracking, and instead of the, the plane being like that, it had dropped, something like a foot. And uh, we were warned off. They, they called for Sir Richard Ferry to come up from Ferries. And um, for quite a while, I remember the best part about this was for about a week, ten days, all the drinks were on the Ferry Aviation Company <laughs> for free. But they, they strengthened them. But of course, limited our dive angle. We went up to Makrahanish and we started really flying then and we would fly twice a day and we did that literally seven days a week. We wouldn't fly twice on a Sunday, we'd probably do a Sunday morning. We had a, a bad time of it. They kept taking the aircraft out of service. We had trouble with the wings. I um, went as second navigator on the skate, taking a convoy through to Iceland once because the aircraft had been grounded. And there was nothing to do. And this is what they did with us. The skate was an old four-stacker from the First World War. <laughs> we got a new aircraft. And uh, Tom said to me, have a look at the wing, Norman. So I climbed up in the greenhouse and had a look at the wing. And sure enough, the wings, which folded, incidentally, it was about two inches higher than the stub plane. So I told, I said to Tom, she's about two inches above the stub plane. He said, well, we'll get her back home. So we took her back to Makahanish. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. The training for torpedo work involved very steep dives. The reason for this was that the aircraft wanted to get to the target out of range of the close anti-aircraft fire. So that means you had to fly over at about 12,000 feet. And to get up to 12,000 feet with a torpedo and an underpowered engine used to take a long time. <laughs> but to avoid the aircraft going too fast and to enable it to control it when you came out of the dive, 
we had dive brakes fitted. Now these dive brakes were called Fowler flaps and they were like extra aerofoils at the after end, after edge of the main plane and slightly below it, about a foot below it. So you had this and it was quite often referred to as the barn door. It was about 12 feet long and perhaps 2 feet, 2 feet 6 wide. And it was used as flaps for landing or as dive brakes. So it would go down for landing and it would go up for dive brakes. Now you can imagine that an aerofoil of that size would change the um, flying characteristics of the aircraft quite dramatically. So we had an elevator trim. Now the elevator on the Barracuda was obviously on the tailplane and it was fitted quite high above the airflow from the dive brakes. Because if you had been um, diving and the dive brakes causing turbulence, that turbulence would have been over the tailplane, which would have meant ineffective control in the vertical plane. So the tailplane and elevators were quite high. And the trim on the elevators was done with a little wheel at your left hand with a handle which you could turn. The wheel, I suppose, a diameter about six inches and you could turn it quite quickly. And you got into the habit of turning it two and a half times when you changed from dive brakes to normal flight or from normal flight to dive brakes. And it was most important that you did change the trim because you couldn't have held it by hand. So when you think of it, you're coming down in a 70 degree dive and that in itself is frightening. And also you've got the chance that the ship's firing at you and also you get the chance that you're going to hit somebody else on the way down. So you're trying to do all this and set the sight and then pull out at the correct height and as you pull out, you leave the dive brakes in the dive position to slow you down from the speed of the dive to the speed for dropping the torpedo. And as you get down to the speed for dropping the torpedo, you select neutral on the dive brakes and immediately trim back two and a half turns. You've got to, otherwise you fly straight into the sea. If you didn't get your hand on the, the trim immediately from controlling the dive brakes, you couldn't have held it by hand on the control part on the stick. So you had to get to the trim immediately, trim back two and a half turns so that you were then flying straight and level. You generally speaking wouldn't forget it, but perhaps not be quite quick enough. I mean, if there was some, something else going on which was distracting you, which is always possible, but uh, there were far too many trainee pirates at Creole who flew into the sea. The first Barracuda attack on the enemy was at Altenfjord, Norway, last year, when they dropped eight tons of bombs on the Turpits and put her out of action for many months. She carries a crew of three, Pilot, navigator, and rear gunner. Here they're off, the wolves of the sea. You'll be hearing of barracudas in the far east, blasting Jap air bases, leaving oil fires burning, smashing up convoys. I mean, the Barracuda, I, uh, we used to get uh, flag officer training and his assistant coach used to come on board, and so I used to, I used to fly him on board. Now, the Barracuda, when it folded the wings, folds in two halves, and uh, you have to check. There's a, a thing that there's no red flags uh, showing on, on the halfway down the wing, you see, which means that the, it's not completely locked. And uh, that... And but sometimes you could just see about that much, and so you were never sure. And uh, I, I was taking this flag off uh, 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 captain and another captain uh, ashore to air from the carrier, and uh, took off in this barracuda. <laughs> and they must have wondered what sort of pilot they'd got because 
uh, I'd got my 15 degrees of flap on on the thing and uh, as soon as I hit, hit the uh, left the deck I could feel it, it, it just somewhat did that straight away because of the pressure the wing, half the wing was undoing the main part was alright but half the wing which comes over with the flap on had come up even further so I lost a lot of uh, lift from that one and uh, so it, it just did that so I had to fight it and get it back and pull the flap up quick because I knew what was, why, why it was doing it okay. and uh, so we were all right, we got ashore all right. But I had to land, oh, I, had to, I had to land at Prestwick, that's right, and uh, use all the runway because I, I couldn't, use the, couldn't use the flaps, so I had to land it without the flaps, which meant it was going to run a lot longer, further, so I landed there. <laughs> but uh, uh, they never said anything to me, but I was supposed to wonder what they, what they thought of the pilot that t- took me ashore. <laughs> When you lost somebody, you you just accepted it, I'm afraid. I lost three pilots in Trincomalee. Stewie Taylor was the first. Our aircraft had been in for service, and he said, I'm going to take it up on a test flight. He took it up. We were outside Trincomalee, and he took it up, flew around, came back on, landed on, picked up a wire, went over the side and was lost. Nobody knows why or how or what. And I I got another pilot, uh, Peter Peter Dick, and I, I didn't fly with him very much. He was a brand new pilot, come out from the States. And uh, he flew in. That was the only time, that was another time when I wasn't too happy. He flew in, in Trincomalee Harbour, and uh, the dry dock blew up in the harbour, and the Valiant was in there, and his body was blown up to the surface. And the captain sent for me and said, uh, they've got a body, they think it's Peter Hick- Dix. He said, will you go ashore and identify him? Well, I didn't fancy that at all. So I saw the surgeon commander, who was a nice old boy, and I told him, I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, you're not supposed to do anything, you're not going. I said, but the captain said, I've got to go. He said, that's all right, I'll fix the captain. So he went. That night he came aboard, I said, you'll have a gin? He said, I'll have a double. I said, right. I said, was it Peter Hicks? He said, oh, I don't know. He said, ah, there's bits of body there. He said, I said, oh, yes, that's him. And he said, what's the difference? And then I got another little lad, Peter Hunter, a Londoner. And I only flew with him about twice. And he flew in. It, when, you, when you were in the North Atlantic, you could fly very close to the water and you could tell how close you were. You get out in the Pacific and the... Indian Ocean, and it's so flat and calm, you're liable to fly in if you do low flying. We did low flying very often. And uh, this is what he'd done, but uh, I wasn't with him, fortunately. So So was the whole air crew lost? He he lost my air gunner and himself. And uh, then I packed in flying. You did? Yes. How, How did you manage to do that? Well, the barracudas were due to come home and the captain sent for me and he said, I want an assistant operations officer. So I said, yes. He said, now look, he said, I'm not forcing you. You can go home with the squadron or you can stay aboard as an assistant operations officer. Well, I thought if I go home, I'm only going to pick up another squadron and goodness knows. So I... I went into the Pacific as assistant operations officer on Victorious.